Rachel, do you, I know it's not. Ah, I was just going to say, is it starting to record? It is, Joe. Thank you. Well, welcome to this evening's meeting of the Climate Change Working Group. I'm Councillor Anthony McEwen, Chair of the Working Group. I'd like to inform everyone present that the meeting will be broadcast live to the internet via the Council's website and will be capable of repeat viewing. The images and sound recordings may also be used for training purposes within the Council. In order to ensure that the meeting is managed effectively, can everyone keep, please keep to the following guidelines for speaking. Uh, councillors should only use the raise your hand function to request to speak and only speak when invited to do so by the chair. Please switch off your camera and microphone when not speaking and remember to set your mobile phone to silent for the duration of the meeting. Any views expressed by any speaker in the meeting are the speaker's own and they do not necessarily affect the views of the council. Please and councillors be aware that the webcast will continue to be streamed live 20 seconds after the close of the meeting. This is due to a time delay in transmitting live. I'll now confirm the names of the remaining members of the working group. Uh, Councillor Tony Ashton, Alan Barrow, Joanna Collins, Charlotte Farrell, Linda Gruby, Madeline Hall, Ian Huddleston, Tony Kemp, David Lomax, Graham Oakley, Kath Thompson, Shannon Thompson, Emily Frayne and Jean Todd. We'll now move on to the agenda, starting with agenda item one, apologies for absence. Uh, I'm aware of apologies from Kath and Shannon Thompson. And Todd? apologies from Councillor Farrell, Chair. And can, uh, Councillor uh, Linda Gruby, uh, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, noting those, if there's no additional ones, we'll move on then to agenda item two. Any declarations of interest on matters before us this evening? Uh, either disclosable pecuniary interests or other interests. Sorry, I think Madeline Hall did give her apologies, didn't she? OK, we'll note those as well then. Uh, there's no declarations of interest. We'll move on then to the minutes of the previous meeting. Then just for accuracy, is there anything on page three, four and five? Are we OK then that these reflect accurately our last gathering? Happy with those, Chair. Thank you, Alice. Yes. Thank you, Joanna. OK, we'll move on again to action since the last meeting. Uh, I've got no particular one myself this evening, but David. I think Chair, with, oh, Julian, um, with, Chair, with, with the agenda um, tonight being largely the um, annual report and an update on the cha um, Climate Change Fund, I think everything will be covered under those items. OK. Thank you very much. We shall move on then. Uh, we've got a presentation from Anethis by uh, Sarah. I won't try pronouncing your second name because I'll get that wrong. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Uh, you're muted. Oop. I'm muted. That's always a good start, isn't it? Um, hello, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the time to hear the presentation I've got today. I will just share some slides. Uh, if that's OK. Someone let me know if that's come through OK. Yep. Done. Great, thanks. So yes, my name is Sarah Tullahoon. I work for Anthesis and we're a sustainability consultancy that has been commissioned for the past year or two um, to support High Peak and Seven Shibboldens councils to uh, it, support them within their net zero action plan development process. Um, so I've been working closely with David and Julian to uh, undertake a number of different pieces of work, which I'll provide a bit of an overview about today. Uh, so my team here is focused on uh, supporting local authorities in the UK, other councils similar to yourselves we're working with um, that are also on the net zero journey and supporting them with analysis, recommendations and strategic development. Um, so just going to uh, run through a few slides with you and obviously um, if there are any questions throughout, please do raise your hand. 
um, as before. A bit of background about Anvisis as an organisation with the largest sustainability consultancy dedicated to uh, uh, environmental uh, work in the in the world. So we are a global organisation, but our UK business uh, works primarily in the UK. And as I mentioned, my team specifically supports local councils on their sustainability and environmental and climate change related activities, both in terms of stakeholder engagement, uh, greenhouse gas analysis, and also uh, net zero strategy planning. Uh, we are B Corp, so we are uh, certified as a B Corp organization who uh, is also sort of walking the talk in terms of managing our own environmental impacts internally. What I'll talk about today, I think the main objectives really are just to provide you all with an overview of the work that we've done to date, because there has been quite a few different elements of support that we've provided, and also hand over the analysis um, and recommendations that we have done from our uh, insights and our uh, expertise to the councils to take action forward. Um, and also outline what the next steps will be. I'll give a bit of an overview of the work that we've done to date with a bit of a timeline. Um, I'll look into a high level overview of the action plans that we've developed supplementary action plans to support uh, a net zero strategy refresh um, for the councils. And then I'll walk you through our recommendations based on the analysis we've done and the feedback that we've received. And then I'll hand over at the end to Gillian Wright, who's going to talk through the next steps in terms of how uh, how she's planning to take forward that action. And there'll be um, some time, I suppose, as long as is needed for any questions after that as well. So the work that's been done to date, uh, just a brief overview. Um, there probably is a lot more that's happened within the councils um, than I can fit on this one page. But I think the main point to, to mention, obviously, the climate emergency declarations for Staffordshire and Moorlands and High Peak Councils were declared in 2019. Um, net zero borough and district by 2030, which is the goal and the ambition that we're all working towards, that all of the, the work that we've done is culminating and supporting. <clears throat> and thesis was then brought on board, commissioned to develop a greenhouse gas baseline for the borough and district to really understand what is the issue um, in terms of greenhouse gases, where are the, the largest sources, um, what are the biggest um, impacts that are happening locally, and where do we need to sort of funnel our attention and efforts in terms of decarbonisation. Um, the councils uh, developed two strategies, part one and two, uh, towards carbon neutrality and aiming low the way to net zero. Those plans were published um, in 2021 and helped to showcase a strategy and some ideas around actions that the council could take internally as an organisation to move towards net zero and also what it might have to influence externally as well. So that was used as, as the basis for the work that we started to support doing um, a, a larger piece of climate action support that started in September of 2021. And we did a number of different pieces of analysis, which I'll shortly talk you through. Um, and that culminated in a two sets of workshops, one for officers and members, which happened at the end of last year, and one, uh, one set of three external workshops um, for businesses, residents and youth which were external, which happened at the beginning of this year. And all of the feedback that we received during those workshops fed into the development of the final uh, supplementary action plans with our recommendations, which was delivered in March of this year. And today, obviously, we're having the session to round up the um, uh, recommendations that we've provided and hopefully take that next step towards taking these actions forward. So and this works uh, mainly on evidence based action planning. So the actions that we recommend councils to do in terms of net zero are based on evidence and it, that's evidence either from analysis that we've conducted ourselves or evidence that uh, similar topics have been raised by other councils um, and using that sort of best practice approach uh, in terms of uh, recommending actions to take forward. So as I mentioned, the strategy part one and two formed the basis of us uh, having a look at what had been done to date, what was already in the plans for uh, the councils in terms of reaching net zero. So we took those actions. Um, we also did an analysis on the procurement spend to look at what the wider impacts of the council's activities could be um, as it relates to emissions from the council supply chain and all of the spend expenditure that the council undertakes. We estimated the procurement emissions based on spend data, and that analysis also forms some part of our recommendations within the action plans. 
We then took a look at agriculture and land use. Um, so obviously with the district and borough being very rural areas, we are where there's a lot of benefits and opportunities around uh, carbon sequestration. So actually storing carbon uh, within the natural environment, but also that there are um, within land use, there are some uh, carbon that gets emitted into the atmosphere. So we took a deeper dive look into agricultural emissions and we did some mapping and modeling of what emissions might look like in future under different scenarios and also considered peatland emissions with that. Uh, as I mentioned, we did six workshops in total, so we engaged with about 150 people uh, across the district and borough from councillors to residents, and we collected about 900 comments from those uh, workshops, which were really useful local insights and knowledge to help inform the action plan, both in terms of what specific opportunities there might be to be made use of and what potential barriers they might be to taking action forward. And finally, we looked at doing a high level biodiversity net gain um, assessment uh, of the local areas to understand the potential with um, some analysis done by our partners as well. All of these different bits of analysis and recommendations fed into the development of the supplementary action plans, which we uh, prepared for both councils and suggested about 250 actions each which form the evidence base for councils to consider. So these are really our recommended actions, which um, which are available to you and, and worth uh, consideration. And those formed across uh, a few different sectors, which I'll talk shortly about. And just to mention as well, that this is very much aligned with what other councils in this area are doing. So um, similar action plans with about 200 or so actions is quite commonplace for uh, many other councils in the UK who also have net zero commitments by 2030. I'll talk a bit more about the action plans then um, to give you a better idea of what's actually within those. So firstly, and this is roughly the sort of layout that we had. So we had uh, followed the structure in terms of sectors that uh, exist within the uh, part one and two strategy. So it looks at a few key sectors, the way we live and everything about uh, improving energy efficiency and moving to renewable heating systems within buildings that are re residential buildings, the way we travel. Um, so looking at reducing travel, um, driving less and switching to electrification of vehicles, the way we work, which relates to improving energy efficiency, but also uh, heating systems within uh, non-domestic buildings and also reducing emissions from industry and industrial processes, as that's also a key area for uh, Hydrogen Staffordshire Moorlands. Um, waste is another key sector, so looking at reducing overall waste and also increasing recycling and um, energy, the way that energy is actually produced, um, hoping to increase renewables um, and ease increasing capacity of different types of renewable technology. The way we look after in our environment, which relates, as I mentioned earlier, to different types of land use management, the way livestock is managed uh, and strategies to consider offsetting and the way we make change occur, which is about engagement. It's about the council using its ability to influence other actors across the district and borough to actually take action themselves and influence those net zero behaviours. Um, so a number of different actions that sort of fell, fall into these goals, um, which then categorised up into the, the same um, sectors that the part one and two strategy also covered. Um, and it's worth mentioning that all of the actions that were mentioned in the part two strategy were or are also included in our um, recommended list, uh, as some of them we're aware are already underway and some might already be resourced and funded. Um, but our, the purpose of our analysis was really to flesh those out and provide additional recommendations for other areas and um, aspects to consider in terms of net zero. Um, we tried to look also at the ordering of these actions um, and whilst it's not possible to sort of put a prioritization on, on the actions, we did look at um, creating a simple three star method for direct impact. So um, some actions uh, may well not actually have a direct emissions reduction themselves, but they might be required as a kind of enabling action to help action occur in other places. Uh, so developing a strategy, uh, providing training, for example, that action might itself might not actually result in a direct emissions reduction, but it would be required in order for another actor or uh, further down the line in terms of the timeline for emissions reductions to be seen. 
So we did some um, uh, high level analysis to um, suggest the direct impact rating across each action. And we considered the cost. So the cost of delivering the action um, in terms of the upfront cost um, and, and lifetime cost, and also considering opportunities around payback. We also looked at carbon savings. So with whether or not the potential action had a large carbon saving benefit um, in the uh, it contributing to it having a higher rating on the carbon saving side and then co-benefits. So co-benefits so outside of um, emissions reduction, what are the co-benefits such as improving health or uh, job creation? Um, those were the third category of direct impact that we considered. So we came up with a three star rating system. Uh, so each each of those three elements, so cost, carbon savings and co-benefits had a star associated and um, and each of the actions were accordingly scored with that starring system. And this really isn't to provide a priority order, but rather to just understand which of those actions might have um, more of a direct impact than some of the others. Um, we also put some additional metrics. Um, so we looked at barriers enablers, as I mentioned earlier, um, a key part of the workshop series was really to understand what are the local barriers and are there any potential opportunities and specific enablers that we have locally that could help us in terms of taking action forward. So those were noted. We also looked into uh, co-benefits in a little bit more detail to understand what specific type of co-benefit and how we might be able to maximize the opportunities from those co-benefits across each action. Um, and within the action level, we also looked at the type. So uh, it, is this more of a strategic action? Is this more of a research and design action? Does this actually require more of a sort of communications element to it? And actually breaking those down by those different types can help see where the council can work more, most strongly. And the council, as you know, might not have the ability to implement action all the time, but it may have a really strong role to play, say, in communicating or engaging with others um, to provide information. Time scale was another key area. So obviously these 200 or so actions can't all happen at the same time. Um, some of them are required to happen earlier. So we looked at categorizing them into some that might already be ongoing, some that might have a shorter term time frame, some that have a medium and some that might be longer term, as in we might need to require to wait for a certain policy to change or certain technology to develop further before it can be taken. We also looked at um, assigning a council team, so um, our recommendations in terms of which council team internally should possibly be uh, responsible for overseeing that particular action um, and actually have responsibility for an accountability over the action. And the action plan is intended to be a sort of living document, so we have it in a, in a PDF format um, for a more visual format. We have also shared with Gillian and David um, an Excel based format, which could probably be more used as um, an ongoing update. But I'll talk a little bit more about monitoring and reporting and how those actions might develop further over time and how we might be able to track towards that net zero goal. Worth mentioning as well, the sort of different levels of control and influence over emissions. I sort of uh, mentioned this earlier, but uh, there are a number of different types of ways in which the council can take action um, depending on its phase of influence, and that's worth noting. So here's an example from the action plans, um, uh, a section specifically looking at improving energy efficiency within privately owned residential properties. Um, so an example, some examples here of some actions. The ones in blue are new actions which we've recommended based on our research analysis and our work with other councils. And the ones in white are those which have, were already existing in the part two strategy for the councils, which um, uh, had already been agreed to previously. And as you can see there on the right hand side, we've got the type of action that that is, the time scale, um, who's going to make sure it happens, i.e. which council team should sort of be overseeing, uh, and also what the direct impact rating as, as previously explained. So recommendations on next steps. Um, I think it's important to consider the overall, I guess, journey that most councils typically take um, and where where the councils are within this journey. So starting from the point of building the evidence base, as I mentioned before, it's really important to understand the numbers. So understand what the evidence is that we're starting from. We did that with the greenhouse gas inventory. 
um, setting targets. Obviously, the council already does have a target in mind of 2030, and that's what's currently being worked towards. Developing an action plan, so that was started with the st strategy part one and two. And now we're developing that further with the addition of these uh, additional recommended actions for consideration um, and then moving on into implementing those actions. So actually taking forward the action, uh, considering where funding is coming from and who's going to have responsibility to actually take the actions forward and how do we prioritize those. And then the final el element around monitoring progress. So are the actions that we're undertaking having the desired impact in terms of that emissions reduction? Um, and reviewing those continuously. So this being that sort of feedback loop cycle um, to feed back in to say, um, do we need to change our strategy? Do we need to update this to reflect the fact that actually we're on track in some areas, but not so much in other areas? And that's where we need to uh, funnel our funding or our resources and ensuring that that information is kind of fed back through the journey. So this is a typical journey that we see for most councils taking when it comes to um, net zero action planning. And in terms of that last aspect uh, around monitoring and reporting, obviously um, we've, we've a lot of work has been done so far in actually understanding what needs to happen and when. Um, so that sort of defining actions uh, element has started to happen already. Um, this is a typical sort of monitoring and reporting uh, track, I suppose, and the different aspects that need to be considered within each. So defining a governance structure, um, we started to take a look at that already with the work we've done to try and uh, suggest a council team to actually have ownership over specific actions. Um, but there still probably is a bit of work that needs to be done to understand how often are they, those actions going to be reviewed? How often should they be updated and, and what the, the governance structure is? Obviously, the fact that these meetings occur and, um, and there are other internal climate change meetings, which with heads of service is really great because that's already a structure that where the kind of feedback can come in. Um, and then defining indicators and developing a logic with those. So how what are the indicators that we're actually using to tell us whether or not we're on track? I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about this element, but this is a really key part of, of sort of taking that action forward. Uh, and then monitoring, evaluating and reporting. So collecting the data set that actually tells us we're on track, you know, the, the number solar panels that are being built or you know what whether it's the the number of trees or the, whatever that metric is that that's being used uh, is actually being monitored at a regular basis the data is being collected consistently we're assessing the change whether it's the going in the right direction that we want it to so there's some element of evaluation uh, and understanding of what those numbers means and then that is being reported and presented so either internally to at groups like this or externally to involve residents and businesses and external organizations. And then of course, as before, adjusting the course. So if any changes are needed, if um, they can feed into the next iteration and the next round of taking action forward to say, we've learned these lessons, this is working well, this isn't working so well. And so these are the changes we need to make. Um, when I mentioned earlier, the uh, metrics, um, I thought it might be useful to kind of give some examples. So of course, overall, we are looking at reducing um, emissions to net zero. So in theory, we should really be tracking at the very least the greenhouse gas inventory to say, is that getting towards net zero um, and how far along are we? But there are a few challenges with using just an overall emissions figure to track action. So the publicly reported data is only available two years in arrears, so it's quite outdated by the time it comes out. So it's only telling us about things that have happened two years ago, which doesn't really help if you've developed a really interesting project to help um, um, action happen locally within the last two years. Also, it doesn't necessarily distinguish between different stakeholders, so you might not be able to understand the impact from different businesses or other organisations, and there isn't really very much granularity to see reductions that might have happened out of the council or other, other individuals investing in specific projects. But it does show us that overall progress to net zero, which we certainly need. The next layer down from the greenhouse gas inventory in terms of metrics is looking at sector based KPIs. So if we're looking at transport, for example, we could say what is the proportion of travel that's made by public transport versus private vehicles? And that could help us understand if the shift is moving in a way that we'd like it to. Um, that's just an example, by the way. 
Um, and, and that's useful because it's hopefully is information that can be more regularly updated. So there's annual travel statistics, for example, that get um, published um, in some cases quarterly, and it could possibly show a more direct uh, impact of investments or um, behavior change programs or engagement programs. And that could probably be something which um, helps uh, uh, shorten the time frame compared to the overall emissions profile. But in these cases, the data might not always cover all areas. It might not always be readily available or it might be owned by other stakeholders. And it does not always easily translate to what is the direct emission savings of the fact that mode share has changed slightly between private vehicles and public transport. So that direct emission savings isn't, we're not really going to understand what kind of an impact it's directly had. We could estimate it, but we wouldn't understand necessarily. And then and then finally, um, the, the, the most granular level would be project specific data. So the council has invested in um, improving the energy efficiency of a specific building, and we can track how the energy consumption has reduced before and after that retrofit. That would be really great granular data to have. Um, it would help us understand what the outcome and the impacts are of specific investments that have happened, and it can help make decision uh, making for future projects and investment. But here, the issue then becomes that uh, there's a lack of consistency, possibly, in metrics used across projects. So what you might track on one building might not be the same as another. You might not be able to compare, um, uh, you know, say, a cycle lane being built or, um, you know, with, with that similar same metric. So there'll be a disparity in the metrics across different projects, which means it's going to be very difficult to aggregate them up and say in total of all the projects that have happened, what sort of an impact has that had on net zero? And also this information isn't always available and uh, not always tracked at the project level. So as you can see, it is quite complex and there are benefits and challenges associated with having um, data at all of those levels, which is why it's actually really important and encouraged to try and track some data at all levels, because that can help build a bit of a better picture and also why it's also often needed to combine the quantitative elements with qualitative narrative as well. So a few considerations when developing KPIs consider the data availability. So is data actually available um, and is it relevant? Um, what is the impact relevance? And also could we combine quantitative and qualitative data to help build the proper picture? And what 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 are the ways of us tracking those co-benefits? So if we're saying we want to create jobs at the same time as reducing our emissions impacts, how how are we tracking that? Um, and are we able to provide some metrics for those? That's everything I wanted to uh, talk through today. I'll hand over to Gillian just to uh, give a brief explanation of how she's planning on taking these recommendations forward. Hey Sarah, that was. Brilliant. <laughs> I'm sure people will have lots of questions for you. Not that it wasn't comprehensive, but it's just um, it's very complex, isn't it? Um, so really what we're going to do is, is really just what Sarah was talking about there is going through that supplementary action plan, which includes all the, the stuff that's in the original plans and working with heads of service or a delegate within that, that team to actually sort of almost sense check them. Like, what can we actually do? What are we doing already? What do we need to make this happen? Is it funding? Is it extra resources? All those sorts of things. Um, and then also looking at, well, how, how do we measure this? What information do we collect ready? What do our partners collect? Um, how can we build into, for example, procurement contracts, collecting um, data and, and things like that? So that's really what we're going to do now. And then once we've done that, We'll collect it all together and try and work out <laughs> to present it and align it to those seven themes within the plan. Um, and then hopefully that will help us focus and actually be able to, to move on to, to delivery, because at the moment we're still very much in the planning phase, I think. Um, and we need to get moving. So I think that's, I don't know if David's got anything else to add to that. He's not there. He is there. No, no, Chair, I think I think that that's everything. I think it, it, it probably underestimated how um, difficult it was actually to produce a, um, a performance um, toolkit that we can bring to members um, for, for all the reasons that Sarah has, has, um, uh, has mentioned. 
but we are looking to bring that to you in October, November time this year, which will then set the ba a baseline that you can um, look at going forward in the future. OK, thanks all. Comments or questions, please. Joanna. Um, yes, thank you for the update. Um, I've got a couple of things to say. Um, I'm really pleased that the council's going through all the actions and seeing which is feasible. And actually, one of my questions is rather about that or connected with that, which is about, I mean, it's about the sort of rural, what I think you've called the wider environment stuff. Because um, I wonder actually how much influence the council can have on this. So, and I thought of two aspects of this. One is peat in that um, a lot of the peatlands are owned by the National Trust. A lot of them come under Moors for the Future Partnership. So I wonder really whether that's within the council's remit at all. And I'd have thought that you would be able to get information from Moors for Future, for example, um, to feed into the monitoring towards net zero. So there's peat, there's also farming and particularly livestock, seeing as most of the farming around here is livestock. Um, and yeah, the council's influence over that. I mean, we know that the NFU pushes back quite strongly in this area about, I mean, in High Peak, about some of the things that we say, and the NFU does have its own plans for reducing carbon. Um, so yeah, so, those are two of the aspects of the sort of natural environment, where, which seem to be rather without the um, council's control. The I also wondered if there was a timeline for getting the actions started, which Gillian sort of rightly talked about. I mean, I think David said November for you to come back with, you know, having gone through the actions to present to this group a list of what's actually going to be taken forward. But it seems to me that this and actually when I was reading the report, which is going to follow later in this meeting as well, there's an awful lot of wheel and measurement and things. And we're nearly four years down the line from the declaration of climate emergency. So it'd be nice to see some acceleration of action. That's yeah, I'll shut up now. OK, thanks, Joanna. Gillian, Sarah. Do you want to come back on those? I mean, I'd just comment just in terms of the action bit. I think one of the other exercises that we'll need to do is match up where we've got actions that are coming through that have already yeah. been taken on and done by some of the services because they are starting to respond yeah. to a variety of areas, but we may not have them listed as an action particularly mm -hmm. at the moment. Yeah, so yeah, some sure. of that work that will need to sort of match the two two strands up and you know hopefully we'll end up with something that we can sort of tick off the list relatively sharpishly yeah there, there are things that are happening i was maybe a little bit <laughs> there you know we are you know we're at the process of bid you know trying to secure funding for retrofit of houses but we're just not at the point where we're actually doing it because we've got to go through all the correct protocols and contracts and procurement and things so we're closer, we're closer than than we can really say at the moment with that one, if you know what I mean. Um, so there are a lot of things that are happening. Um, but yeah, there's a lot still that we can try and accelerate, I think, as well. Um, yeah, so David's got his hand up. David? Yes, Chair, I was, I was going to, well, you've I've already um, said some of the points that we, we are looking at two aspects. We're looking at um, the actual measures um, to bring to you, bring forward to you, but also um, an action tracker. So um, we we've got we, we've got a, a preliminary version of that. So there are actions, as um, Julie mentioned, the lad three work, but we've obviously had the the lad two work that's taken place to improve our own housing. We had the energy audits that have taken place, the pilot of the um, hydrogenated vegetable oil which is now being rolled out so yeah I wouldn't, I wouldn't want you to take away that I meant that nothing would um, 
is happening until November. It's just we're in a better place, I think, to report in in November. So uh, the, the actions are taking place. In, in terms of the other point about um, rural emissions, I think what we've done with the climate change plan is we obviously divided it into part one and part two. I think going forward, we'd probably uh, lose that um, that terminology because I don't think it's particularly helpful. But um, certainly with the, the part two plan, um, looking at the borough as a whole, the idea is for that to provide more of a framework um, for reducing emissions and tackling climate change across the borough. So we wouldn't expect that we would deliver everything in there. And similarly, um, we're just about to press uh, the button on the contract with uh, Derbyshire Wildlife Trust to carry out um, the work to produce the plan for nature. So a lot of the things you, you mentioned about peat restoration, etc., would form part of that. And similarly, that would uh, there is a big um, section on the land that's in the Borough Council's own ownership, but again, it will be largely setting the um, the scene for the borough um, and helping people um, make those decisions about uh, uh, yeah, what, one of the frequent things we get asked about is tree planting and, and what and where. Um, so Part of what we want to do is is get that balance right. That tree, you know, appreciate trees aren't the answer to to everything. So um, you know, the right thing in the right place. But it is about providing that framework um, to, to work with others, and hopefully that's what um, the wildlife trust um, will will give us once we've um, finalised that contract which it probably will be in next well I'm on holiday from Sunday but so as soon as I come back um we'll then bring that to this group and probably ask Derbyshire Wildlife Trust to present what they're doing as well. Thank you Chair. Thanks Owen. Joanna does that sort of answer or give you more or less I mean I still do think that there are aspects of the sort of rural stuff where the council's influence is really very much less than, for example, on housing, where, you know, it already has a remit, a legal remit to look at fit for habitation and that then feeds and could feed into, you know, is it warm enough, to put it very crudely. Um, whereas on livestock, I don't see that the council really can have very much influence. So I, I think there's a sort of difference in, in level of influence that the council can have. And yeah, it's, it's I suppose the point I was trying to make. I think I think there's some of it, some of it, it will be around that partnership working. So the Peak Park, as was discussed elsewhere earlier in the week, the Peak Park are going through the processes to review their sort of the management plan, their version of the local plan. And there will be some synergies, I suspect, that we'll be able to find on some of those areas. And I think it's probably worthwhile at some point them coming to do a bit more of an update on that because they're particularly, although it may change when they get their new chief executive, but at the moment in the discussions that they've had with the borough so far, they are wanting to particularly focus on some of the climate change issues. Yes, yes, I'm sure. I think actually they have a local plan as well as a management plan because they're, uh, to be honest, um, to because they're a planning authority. They, they are talking of merging the two things. Oh, OK. OK, thank you. OK, Jean. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of reiterate the thing that uh, about Vision Derbyshire because we are obviously working with Vision Derbyshire and I went on an, an update this morning with Vision Derbyshire and had uh, um, presentations about housing, uh, renewable energy, planning, um, trees, tree planting and these are all things that we, we need to be working together on throughout Derbyshire and I think that uh, as you said David the the peat and um, livestock areas 
will come into that the local local nature recovery strategy and that is a derbyshire thing it's not just our remit we have to fit in with their strategy as well that's how i understand it anyway Thanks, okay, thank you do any of you want to come back on jean's comments um, as I understand, and I could be wrong, I think that High Peak has the majority of the peatlands in Derbyshire, to be honest. So I think it's probably not quite as high up Vision Derbyshire's agenda as we would put it on our own, to be honest. I think it's noted, but I don't, I don't think it's such a, a prior, you know, I don't think it's such an issue. I could be wrong. OK, it's, well, OK, Pete wasn't yeah. mentioned in this update. I must right. admit. Okay. It has been mentioned in meetings that I've been in and, <laughs> and everybody's just looked at me blankly. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, they haven't. No, it's, it's yeah, I, I don't think it's a, a big an issue elsewhere, really. OK, thanks. Tony. OK, thanks. Tony? Thank you very much for that. I've got the term microphone on there. Um, thanks, Anthony. Um, yeah, uh, the, the uh, retrofitted housing, um, how, how much of a difference is that going to make to the uh, emissions? It's not going to take them down to, um, to zero. Wh where will it take them? Um, the scheme that we're working with um, is called the Sustainable Warmth Competition at, that we're currently doing um, and it's split into two parts uh, in this round um, dependent on whether somebody's on or off grid, gas grid that is, sorry. Um, and it basically aims to take them for the energy performance certificate, you know, that you get when you buy a house or rent a house. Um, it takes them up to C. So it doesn't take them to net zero, but it takes them up to a, a band C. That, yeah, that, that, that's not particularly high though, is it? It's a lot of, some houses can't even achieve C, um, particularly around about here, where there's a lot of hard to treat houses, I guess. Um, but I suppose, the, that's the government that comes from Bayes government policy and I suppose they assume if that's sort of aligned with the fact that the grid is going to decarbonize over the next couple of decades that the two of them together will get to net zero by their target of 2050 I guess okay well that's that sounds like it's one that will will need some sort of further information on I suspect as well there probably is that element of will there be a plan from government at some point further down the line for those properties that can't be you know more can't have more done to them to bring them higher up the, the standards I suspect you know possibly some of the farmhouses and you know older houses sort of out in the patch maybe those more difficult ones and I suppose you can't sort of always rely on the what seems to be the mantra from some parts at the moment yeah stick a heat pump in it and that solves all the problem yeah. i think as well as there's the enforcement you can't make somebody insulate their house if you know it's because it's quite it can be quite invasive particularly with the hard to treat where you have to basically empty your house and have internal wall insulation and then you have to redecorate and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big ask for some people so there's that part of it as well Okay, thanks. Tony, does that sort of start off with a part of an answer to it? But I think it's one we'll have to come back to. I think it is one that, that, that keep, we will have to come back to. It's one that I keep banging on about because I just can't see us achieving it by 2030 or anything like 2030. Is it is it possible to calculate uh, how far Getting up to to EPC rate C will cut our emissions at the moment. There's or generic cut, Sorry, Jean. Cut the borough's emissions, I should 
Yeah, there's sort of generic assumed figures that you can apply for every measure that you do. So you, if you did cavity wall insulation and you're in a terraced house, then they would expect that you would save X amount. And then it would depend on what heating type you use. So if you use oil or gas or electric, it would, it would be different. So all these things, um, when they do the EPC, that certificate, um, it, all these things feed into the metrics in the background and it, and it spits out a number. And there are, there are actually carbon and energy saving uh, figures on there. So you, you, yeah, you, you yeah, could well, It would be useful to see the, the actual calc the estimate of how, yeah. of how much it will save us, actually. Yeah. Yeah, but it would be a sort of forecasting, a, a, a clever guesstimate, it would be, yeah. Very nice. Joanna? Sorry, I completely agree with you, Anthony, about central government. I mean, if the whole grid was decarbonised, then heat pumps and so on would actually be carbon neutral. Um, as I understand it, um, which actually suggests, I mean, should there be, if we are really trying to get to net zero by 2030, should there also be a strand of, under the kind of engagement type strand of trying to influence government, perhaps through Vision Derbyshire or however? I mean, um, it's, sorry. it's included as part of the strategy. Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of partly disagree with David's comment around the sort of whether we in the future we still have it sort of split as a part one and a part two in terms of the action plan because there's a little bit for me having a little bit of clarity over those actions that we've got the more direct control over and those that we've got that influencing role yeah we may well not call it part one and part two it may be you know internal external whatever but I think there's a, a usefulness to having some of that clarity for the stuff where we will have to either work with others or lobby others to get some of those differences. Gillian? Yeah, I agree. You could have it as one document in two parts. That would make sense. So it's one place for people to look if they were, I think that's probably what David had in mind, to be honest, because I think we can't really, there'll still be separate actions, but we, but we do want to measure the council as an organization in the services as well. We do. Yeah. I, I entirely agree, Chair. It, it was more the terminology of part one or part two, not meaning ed, anything outside the council. But I, th I think where there will clearly be need to be a focus on our own emissions, which would be a different set of actions to influencing actions um, out there. And, and just to pick up on Councillor Collins' point, um, lobbying government and um, is included in, in, I think, the seventh part of the the action plan so uh, we we are quite reliant i mean whether or not there would ever be appetite to reconsider the 2030 figure but i mean that is based on certain assumptions that certain things happen at the national level and if there are delays there or that thing or it doesn't deliver the reductions that um, we hope for then that makes it obviously increasingly difficult for us to make our own local target and, and as well as sort of the the intended influence in sort of our membership of bodies like UK 100 and so on, uh, I think they'll probably have a greater impact in terms of being able to influence government a little more than uh, perhaps just us. OK, any any further questions or comments? Jean? Yeah, sorry. Um, another update that we had was from Derbyshire Dales, who are creating a, a solar farm to help with their emissions, to reduce their emissions. Uh, I wondered if people would be interested in um, having a presentation from them because they're offering to, to support other areas. I, I suspect going, going off the comments from the, the outside firm that was looking at, whether it was just very site specific or uh, about solar farms in general, there may well be not as much of an appetite, but I think it's probably worth hearing them talk, uh, even if it's not necessarily something we pursue ourselves directly. But we can mm -hmm. set it up for a future one. I know they are having, or they've had some sort of event recently, 
or they've got one coming up where they're looking at some of the some of that wider sort of engagement issues. I think it's well, they're, they're very happy to help other authorities anyway. Yeah. OK, if there's no more questions or comments, then if I can thank Sarah for the presentation and we shall move on to the draft climate change annual report, which also includes at the start of it uh, some of the feedback on the consultation from the, the part two consultation. Gillian. I think the part two consultation was actually from the last meeting. I think that's part of the minute, so it's an appendix, so it's not actually part of the annual report. But it can be if you want it to be. <laughs> ah, no, you're right. Sorry. I'm, yep. I'm reading it as a blank page in between, so I'm just thinking it's part of the next bit. Oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, th that's certainly a point. So this is a, a draft report. Um, it's the first one we've done. Um, so we'd really um, be grateful if people could spend some time and read it and feedback what they think of the content, what they think of the, the layout, if they think it's, if it, you know, will be well, be well received in different settings. We try to keep it um, plain English-ish so that it could be, you know, read by the public um, who who'd maybe aren't experts in, in certain fields. Um, yeah, so it was just really to, to, so the idea is that this report will be created annually uh, following the similar format and then it'll get uh, presented to um, exec, I think, is the is the plan. But I'm very happy to add things in if people want, or you know, um, if there's anything that's not clear the way it's written, or if you absolutely hate the layout, leads feedback. That's an opportunity to get this um, get this as set up. And we can change it as time goes on, but it'd be nice to keep it in a kind of sort of literate format so that everybody can follow it, kind of thing. OK, next, Gillian. Uh, comments or questions, please. David. I've just been a little bit picky on page 19. Uh, I'm just going back to my screen to get it up myself. It's talking about the transition new mills. The second sentence, the thing mm. was a thermal imaging camera. Can we rephrase that? <laughs> yeah. They bought a thermal imaging camera, which people can borrow. It's because it's a library of things. It was a bit of a play on words, but I'm very happy to it, change that. <laughs> very happy to change it, yes. OK, thanks, David. Tony? Could someone explain to me why there's so few uh, uh, targets put in for subsequent years, 2025 and 2030? David, you want to answer that? These are the 25 and 2030, I think. That's the um, cash flash. That's what we mentioned before about the piece of work we're going through at the moment to um, to agree a set of indicators so we're hoping that to bring that well we will bring that battery in october november time uh, which will uh, refine the the measurements and the baselines but also um provide more realistic targets that i think um, five-year targets probably aren't that helpful that's what all we had um, when we produced the original strategy but we will bring back um more regular targets for you to measure performance against. OK, thanks, David. Is it worth us adding a note to that section, just sort of the same, mm -hmm. essentially that, that we're still going through a review process? Yeah. Tony, do you want to come back at all? No, that's, uh, uh, that, that's fine. I, I would have thought some of these are not too difficult to uh, uh, to gauge uh, and, and, and to fix targets for, but um, yeah, uh, when I can appreciate that some of them are uh, very much more difficult. Yeah, when I when I go through that exercise we were talking about earlier with the heads of service, that part of it's going to be looking at these indicators and then other indicators. So we'll we'll maybe be able to flesh some of that out if it's not too um, complex as part of that exercise as well. So hopefully, uh, when we next present the refreshed indicators, that will be a, be better, as David said. Okay, Joanna. Is 
If you're talking, you're still on mute. Sorry. Yeah, um, I've got a few things. On page 12, it says, although emissions are reducing in high peak, in fact, they're reducing by 1%. So I think that should say something like, though emissions are reducing slightly in high peak, because otherwise it's not really reflecting where we're at. Um, then on page 16, there's something about an audit on potential for renewables, which I thought was re sounded really interesting. Um, so I wondered if there could be something about um, there's been an initial audit. I wondered if there could be something sort of saying the result of that audit, even if it was just a very brief summary, like there's no potential, or there's more, there's a bit of potential we'll be exploring further or something like that. Um, I'm not very happy about the emphasis on trees as I live in a peaty area, but I suppose, but David has said, you know, the right action in the right place. Um, I'm not quite sure what litter has to do with climate change. There was something about litter on page 18. Was it the litter picking? It uh, was, fit, yeah. Fit pick. The reason I took that in was because it was encouraging people to get out and walk. So it kind of, I felt that it, it linked because it was getting people moving and it might encourage them to not get in the car and go to the shop. We could maybe make that a bit clearer. Then. Yeah, yeah, yep. okay, yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, and then one of the targets, the urban trees target, I thought was a bit, I mean, I, I suppose I don't know very much about urban, you know exactly how the urban trees would work but i can't find it now but you very nearly reached your target for 2025 i thought i, th I think what you have to I bear in mind sorry, sorry. What you yeah, have sorry to, go on yeah what you have to bear in mind with the tree target in high peak we're losing ash trees by the hundred and that's a that's a big that uh, contributes okay, a yeah. lot towards our, our canopy cover. So uh, although it looks like we could sit back and do nothing, actually we're gonna to have to Yeah, it's gonna go yeah. the it's gonna go the other way, isn't it? So and that's yeah. something that we should have I should have put in that actually. So I'll add in something about ash tree. Yeah, no, that's yeah. well. Um also although the recycling targets are very much better than they were a few years ago, as I remember. Um, I think there's something about overall amount of rubbish, mm -hmm. which is also very important, of course. Yeah, I agree. So I don't know if there's a, you know, if anywhere there's a target for that, which could go in here. We collect the data so we can always... Yeah. Look at look at that. So the data exists that that wouldn't be difficult to start tracking it. Yeah. So Joanna, how would you want a target like that to show? Um. Well, I mean, I'm you know, I know some. Obviously, I don't know <laughs> sort of all about this, but I'd have thought there would be something about you know, if you send twenty tons to landfill you're likely to get X greenhouse gas emissions. So um, you could measure it just by tonnage. And then when you came to measure the overall reduction in emissions of the emissions, then you could do a simple calculation, I'd have thought. I mean, I'm not sure about that, but I would have thought that kind of thing probably exists because OK, because we, we sort of already show that with the percentage of waste sent to recycle and then the residual waste mm. is the stuff that's heading for landfill or. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, is that in this report? Yeah, uh, page 12. Oh, OK, yeah, no, that, that's what I meant, really. Yeah, yeah. OK. And then that's uh, sorry, that's per um, 
per household that number. So unless you wanted the, the total for the borough, that would be a different number, obviously. Um, I don't know how valuable I that is. I guess it doesn't is. really matter. I mean, perhaps the total makes more sense at this level. Mm. But I mean, obviously, the two are so closely connected that I guess you just multiply one by the other, but it doesn't really matter to me. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Joanna. I've got David, then Jean. Sorry. Uh, the page 12 of, let me get it back again. I'm sure Emily will correct me if I'm wrong. It says chose low carbon, should not it be choose low carbon for the second point down on page 12, uh, page 22 or page 12 of the report? Page 22 of the report and page 12 of the presentation, rather. Yeah. Is it to do with um, procurement policy? Is it that one? Yes, it's the one. Yes. It. Yeah, yeah, it's a typo. We'll, yeah. we'll reduce okay. the number of products purchased by the council. Choose low carbon yeah. slash carbon neutral products. Yeah, OK. OK, thanks, David. Jean? I was just going to mention, oh, by the way, the the uh, recycling rate is slightly above what it actually is in that at the moment. Oh, yeah, it was. We've got 54 percent there. Yeah. It's not that much. Um, the and the renewable energy study. Was at a, we did have a, a presentation about it to the local plan um, subcommittee. I don't know whether you saw that, Joanna. But, but uh, um, no, it I, didn't, sorry. I think it should be complete now. It wasn't complete at that stage, but I wonder when they are going to issue the results and who was. It was we'll, done by DCC. We'll get that checked out. I, I think from the from the meeting that was at a Monday. It, it was still in the pending being assessed by officers at DCC um, before it comes to us stage. Yeah, certainly they mentioned it at this in this planning bit today, but, I, but they didn't mention a, a result from the report, to be honest. There's, there's two things. There's the energy audits of our own buildings, which we're going to put oh, a line okay. in the result, but that's for the, for the, for the uh, potential for renewables across the county. So it could be like standalone in a field, you know, or a solar farm, like you mentioned, um, and that's DCC. And I, I think it's it's due later, early autumn. It's soon. It's imminent. So it's coming. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Jean. Yeah. yeah. And more, more questions or comments? No. In that case, then we'll move up to move on to an update on the climate change fund uh, but if you do have any further comments on it or if you spot something having a another read of it later uh, if you can let Gillian or David know okay climate change fund Gillian um well it's in the report but I just wanted to give people the opportunity to ask any questions because obviously these um uh, clubs and groups that we've awarded uh, might be within their areas or, or have a particular interest of theirs. Um, the first one uh, we awarded was, uh, in, in total there was uh, six that we awarded and it was about just over £3,000 in total. And um, so the baby bank, it says Bucks and Baby Bank, but they actually work across High Peak and beyond now. And they've been a bit of a, a victim of their own success. And so we're struggling with basic, um, Logistics, so really the, the grants to help them keep going because they actually prevent so much equipment going into landfill, but also help young families get started and things. So, it, and it's really embedding that um, thinking about reusing stuff at an early age for people as well. So, I really liked that kind of idea of changing people's mindset a little bit. I think it will have long term impact. Um, and then there was the uh, Glossop allotments. Uh, they want to improve their soil uh, health and they want to uh, increase their yields um, to help 
people um, struggling with food so they can provide perishable foods um, up there as well, which is great um, to people. And then Men in Sheds work with the Gloucester Allotments and they're um, repurposing stuff uh, and re repurposing old tools um, to make into bat boxes and troughs and, and what have you. So we've, we've made a nice connection there with um, AES as well because they're going to provide them with things like pallets and stuff like that. So there's a bit of added value we've had there. Um, Sustainable Hayfield, this is a really interesting project. I've um, they're going to be targeting um, villages and the village villages, sorry, um, with very. Um, they're going to be working with March's Energy Agency, who deliver the Derbyshire warmer homes to really you know, postcode by postcode, like target houses. And it's something that if 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 it works, then we could use the model and replicate across you know the different parts of the borough. So I've asked them to share all the learning with us as much as possible to get that really one-to-one -one, hands on approach um, to energy efficiency. Um, transition to new mills, we gave them a thing, sorry David, <laughs> of the thermal imaging cameras. So they've set up and they've got they've just taken over the um, old uh, information office. So I went to the opening and it's a really nice community space um, and they're going to have an internet of internet of things, sorry, a library of things um, where people can borrow. And so we've let, given them some money to buy a thermal imaging camera and they'll provide training to people how to use them because they're not quite as straightforward as you might think. Um, and then some other bits and pieces just to help get that project off the ground. And then lastly, um, Whaley Bridge After School Club. So they want to set up a little allotment and do a health eating programme with the kids after school. So that was great. So that's the six. The fund is now open for round two. Um, it'll be open, I think it's the 19th of September um, is the closing date. So if you can please share it on any of your social media channels or if you have a newsletter that goes out to your constituents or anything like that, it'd be really great if you could um, do that because it'd be nice to get a a bigger um, reach of different groups. So that's that. Okay, okay thanks, Gillian. Any questions or comments, anyone? No. Okay, we will have a further update, obviously, after the. Oh, Joanna? Yeah, I just wanted to ask the baby bank. Hmm. Are they looking for stuff? Because I'm compiling just for our local new our local e um, like newsletter um a list of where to recycle stuff. I would imagine so. Um, if yeah, if you, I can send you the email of the lady. That'd be good. Yeah. yeah Thank I'll you. I'll do that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'll send you that tomorrow. Oh, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Joanna. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so we will have a further report back after the second round has closed. Uh, but again, sort of if you if you've got any local groups that are working on sort of green themed projects, uh, please do get them to consider sticking a bid in. Uh, you can get the details and information on how to make a bid from High Peak CVS, who are hosting the the process for us. Okay, there's nothing else. We'll move on then to agenda item eight, date of next meeting. We're presuming that folk won't, won't want to meet towards the uh, end of August, uh, so we're presuming that uh, a meeting in September will be OK, uh, unless anyone wants to speak now. No, in that case, then we'll get a date circulated uh, once everyone's either come, gone on holiday and come back or getting ready for their holidays and we'll get a date circulated. Uh, and that brings us to the end of our business this evening. Uh, so we can thank you all for your attendance and wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thanks.